Welcome to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books, the podcast featuring interviews with writers of all types. Today's episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books has been sponsored by Nene's Treats. That's N-E-N-E-S treats.com, a family-owned and operated crumb cake business based in Charleston, South Carolina, which my in-laws have a little bit to do with. Uh, that's Nene's treats.com. Get your crumb cakes on Nene's treats.com or Gold Belly and enjoy. I'm here today with Madeline Paquette, who is a certified sommelier and the co-author of Wine Folly Magnum Edition, along with Justin Hammock. With a background in design, Madeline launched the website winefolly.com, which has become the world's most popular wine blog. She currently lives in Seattle, Washington, so welcome to Madeline. Welcome, Madeline. Thanks so much for being on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so you start your book, Wine Folly, Magnum Edition, uh, with a section called Why Love Wine. So can you tell listeners why love wine if they don't happen to already? Um, well, it's it's really a, it's a really fascinating beverage because it gives you um, – it's sort of a way to get into the, the world and discover the world of wine because wine grows pretty much everywhere. And every single wine around the world has a different story to tell about that region, about that place, and that people. Um, so if you want to get into wine on that level as sort of in a cultural exploration, it's lots of fun. But there's more. It's it's about the soils. It's about the ge- geology of the region. It's, it's so many layers. So if you wine will go as, willing, uh, as, as deep as you're willing to dive, that's <laughs> sort of how I put it. Um, but you know, for someone who just likes to drink and to taste, um, it's, it's at that level too. Um, so it's lots of fun to explore as one of those things that follows along with you in life. Um, if you let it into your life. Love it. So why do you think moms in particular get such comfort from a glass of wine at the end of a long day? I think you said it right there. I, I think there's really something to be said about, ending your day and sort of putting a, a punctuation on the end of your day and a wine, wine had just even the pouring a glass of wine. And I'm sure people are imagining this right now while listening are going, yeah, there's a moment when you open that bottle of wine, you pour it into a glass, you can, you can finally sort of breathe out and exhale and, and, What's amazing about wine is it has, if, if, if you taste it actively and if you're paying attention to your wine and not just drinking it, um, you have another sort of slower process that happens and it sort of activates senses. You're using your nose and you're smelling with your nose and you're paying attention to smells. And um, I don't know how other you know moms feel about this, but smelling can be a really harsh thing <laughs> in a mom's world. So it it's... To allow yourself to smell and to enjoy is 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 a, is a small pleasure that we can take um, every day if we want to, and even if you're trying to drink, drink responsibly, we can do that every day. And I like what you said also about how it, it helps mom sort of breathe at the end of the day. And doesn't wine breathe too? Maybe there's something related to that, right? <laughs> it does. Yeah, it's been cooped up in a bottle for a long time, so. Um, it helps to actually aerate your wine. And the simplest way to do that is actually just to pour it in your glass and just swirl. Um, and that helps quite a bit. Cool. Maybe it's like a mom taking a bath too, right? You just like, <laughs> like <laughs> maybe that is something yeah, I like don't that. Know. Yeah. There's some analogs there. I think I'll yeah, they say that great wines age well and, you know, I think probably great moms do too. Oh, I so. don't know about that. <laughs> I might have to disagree, but anyway. <laughs> Um, so you are a sommelier. So how did you end up being a sommelier? Like, what was your training? Did you always know you wanted to be one? Um, it's such a cool job. How did the, how did you end up with that? Be become um, a sommelier? Yeah, I actually started out wanting to be a musician, and uh, so I went to a music school, and I realized I was not going to have a job in music very <laughs> easily. So I dual majored in art and design, and uh, so I worked as a graphic designer. And so my way into wine was more more on the side. I really enjoyed tasting wine. It was lots of fun. And it was my dad who got me a wine subscription when I turned 21. This is when I was in art school. And I you have to imagine I was 
slumming it <laughs> in art school. I was living in my studio. Where, where, I, where, I, where I, was this? What what part of the world? This is oh yeah, I was living in Valencia. I was going to California to the arts. Okay, and um, it's in it's in around around LA, and you know, you kind of hang out, you just do art all day and you focus and you're so focused on things. So like when these bottles came in, they were exotic and fancy. <laughs> like they might not have been that expensive, maybe $15 bottles of wine. But to me, $15, that's like a night out on the town. <laughs> that was a big deal. So, uh, they were the, and this is going to sound kind of weird, but they were the fanciest things I would put in my mouth for an entire month. <laughs> so I sort of had this, I sort of put them on a pedestal a little bit. Uh, and then I tasted this one wine that, um, tasted like, um, wines, everybody's describes the fruit flavors like, Ooh, blueberries or strawberries and vanilla. I tasted olives and it really threw me off. And then I became obsessed with the olive flavor, and I wanted to repeat the experience. So I bought more of the wine, and little did I know the vintage had changed, and it was no longer the same thing. It was not the wine that I that I liked that I had purchased because the vintage had changed. And so in that purchasing experience, I learned about vintage variation, and I learned about the wines of France, like all in one fell swoop. Um, and that was. Uh, that was my entryway into wine. And then uh, later on in 2008, I lost my job. <laughs> it was a market crash, and I had a condo, and I was needing to pay the mortgage. So I picked up a job helping a guy. Uh, he had just opened a wine bar. I was I, pol- I polished thousands of glasses at this point. <laughs> um, but he let me taste and make friends with the distributor, and they used to blind taste me on wines all the time. And I noticed I, I really had a knack for it, and I had, I had so much passion for it. And I loved helping people pick out wines and pick out flavors. And so I just figured out how to put my design, uh, with the wine. And, and that's how I started winefolly.com. So cool. So what, so wine folly that you started with Justin Hammock, right? What Mm -hmm. it's the most popular wine blog in the world. How did that happen? What, like, what do you think makes it the most popular? What, what's, what's your secret? Um, well, there's the technical answer would be a lot of really smart, uh, design and optimization for the internet, um, would be the technical answer. Um, but it, it truly comes back to people because people have to come back and choose the blog in order to think that it is the best. Um, so, um, that was my, my work and that was the content and to creating articles that actually help people learn, um, and, and are maybe a little bit more pragmatic, um, and answering the questions that people actually have. You know, what sommeliers learn, what I've learned in the process of starting this website, is uh, consumers have different questions. Like, they want to know the best wine for a keto diet. Mm-hmm. Like, a sommelier doesn't necessarily know that. They could work through the answer. <laughs> but, like, that's that's the type of questions we get asked on the Internet. That's the type of question that someone would ask the Internet. So, I, when I answer those questions, um, that's how... And I do it in a helpful way that doesn't really make feel, people feel bad about themselves and their choices. Because truly, everyone has their own, we all have our own preferences and, and that sort of thing. And my taste palette is going to be different than yours, and that's fine. That, like, I, you know, the great thing about me is I'll drink just about anything. So we can drink together and that'll be, that'll be a grand old time. Oh, good. Come on over. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'll be right there. Great. Um, so you had this amazing website and you turned it into a New York times bestseller, your first edition of wine folly. What was that process like for you? It was really hard. Um, it was, it was hard for many reasons. Um, I'd never written a book before. I'd never written a multi-page report in college because I went to art school. So uh, developing the design systems to create a 230 page book was, a great deal of effort and I was a hundred percent determined to do it right and to do it well. And, um, then right before the pub publication, um, on my husband's birthday, just as my husband, um, his dad passed away. Oh no. And, and so we, we had already sort of, he had, his dad was getting sick at the beginning of the year and we did like postpone things with the book and it was really hard to work on it while this was all happening, because it just didn't seem important. You know, his dad was really, really important in his life. And um, so 
you know, it was when it all happened, like I was, I was trying to hustle and get the book out there, but like, I was so deeply worried and concerned about my husband and his family and, and, and I was hurting too. I mean, his dad was a very magnanimous person in our lives. So it was like, it was a shock. It was, it was, it was, and, um, it was actually the most amazing growing experience. You know, I look back on his dad and I have very warm, happy feelings about him now, but then it was, it was really a shock, but, I. Uh, It was a growing up experience. It was like, okay, Madeline, put on your big girl pants. Right. (laughs) You're going to do this thing. Because after that, Dustin sort of stopped working on the site, and he didn't want to do it anymore. He he sort of had this, like, aha moment. Uh, It was almost like a midlife crisis in his 30s. And he just, he's like, I need to do what I'm the best at. And and you seem to be doing okay, and you're going to either, you're going to either swim or sink, and i got to let you swim or sink. So I'm running the site on my own now. And it's doing pretty well, which is good. But in the last couple of years, I've basically learned how to do it. And so this next book was really me being like, okay, Madeline, let's let's do it for real. We learned from our first book. And the first book is a great book for beginners because it's very welcoming and it's super fun and bright colors. And, and, and you know, a beginner who's even just 21 will get a lot out of it mm-hmm. and enjoy it. But this book was more like... I've learned from my readers that they're smart, mm-hmm. that they know, they might not know anything about wines, but they're smart people and they learn very quickly. And the way that I'm communicating with this visual design, this whole book is all visuals, uh, they learn really, really fast. So they look, they look at these pages and they just absorb it all really quickly. And so it's, it means it's working. Right. That method, method of teaching is working really well. Um, but so in this next book, I was like, well, what if I was trying to teach someone to become a sommelier? Like, what if they wanted to know as much as a beginner song with the quartermasters or something like that? So I, I use that as sort of my, my lighthouse in the distance. Okay. Does that, is that what a sommelier learns? And then I, and then I thought to myself, well, sommeliers, a lot of them can end up turning into snobs. How do I teach someone so that they not only know what a sommelier knows, but they're not too snobby about it, right? Yeah. They're not too prideful. So the knowledge is free and is welcoming, and they feel like everyone should know it. And so that was the goal of this book, is to get you psalm status without the sno- psalm snob. I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Great. I just made that up. That sounds kind of good. <laughs> I, I like it. I think we gotta, we're gotta. we going to, like, you know, trademark the, the slogan now. <laughs> Take it on the road. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm so sorry that your first book experience um, became sort of mired in that loss for you. That's awful. I'm, I'm really sorry. Um, it's okay. It's okay. It was it happened. I know. And just... you know, it happened. And that, and I can look back on that whole experience. And it, it's kind of nice that I have a piece of something that places it in time. Right. You know. Yep. Yeah. So, what did your husband actually want to do instead? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> Um, well, he just started getting interested in, he's, he's like the boy of the internet. He's always been really deeply interested in, uh, future technology and where the internet's going and all that sort of stuff. So he started really getting into the future blockchain technology and trying to understand how it works and how it's going to be implemented. So like, yeah, everybody's investing in, in cryptocurrency now and stuff, but what, what, how is it going to work? What's it going to do? Who's going to make these things that are, what's the future of the internet? How's it actually going to work and all that stuff? So he's really into that now. And I support him fully. I think it's awesome because I like the idea that he's the boy of the internet because he was there when it started Mm -hmm. and he's there, um, you know, he's there, you know, in the next stage of where the internet is going. So... I, 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 I'm very happy for him, but still though, he is my primary advisor Mm -hmm. I run everything by him. Um, he's, he's kind of more of a strategic thinker and I'm more of the person on the boat who paddles really hard (laughs) and does all the every, you know, every, the every day, um, you know, uh, and so I use him to bounce off big ideas and he usually finds flaws in a lot of my big crazy ideas, which I have now you know, started to embrace. 
And before I used to be very defiant with them. And now I'm like, no, that's a great idea. Keep talking. Don't stop talking. Okay. And I write it all down. And then I actually turn it into a systemized plan and I execute on it. Hmm. Um, so it's, it's a different type of, he, he does a different type of thinking that I really appreciate. And that's why he's an author on the book. He didn't make the book, but mm-hmm. he helped create the strategy that ended up resulting in a book. So um, he gets authorship on that. I don't care. Lucky guy. <laughs> I can do whatever I want. He can have that. <laughs> that's really sweet. I know I always, um, like I love collaborating with my husband Kyle on and things, and I always wonder like what you're saying. Like, does it really work? Or does it add to tension? Does, does it create tension? Like, is it a risk? Oh God. Or, I don't know. Does it ever? <laughs> I don't know. Some 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 husband wife duos are like power team partners. Mm-hmm. I've always been a little bit competitive with my husband when we're not just being husband. Like when we're being husband and wife, we're super pals and support each other. And that sort of things, but he's very smart and I'm very snarky. So sometimes, <laughs> and so we do have a little bit of sort of manning up and, and, and it, 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 it makes for a lot of fun adventures that him and I have together. Um, but when you're trying to run a business together, it was a nightmare. It was honestly, I was, um, I'm, I like to blame myself for it because I, you know, there's, we can always be better. So I don't really want to blame him and his shortcomings because he's got, he's got his own road to go on, you know? But, uh, yeah, I think I could have been a better, more open, uh, team member with him when I was working with him and not be so, you know, rigid Mm -hmm. in my goals and, 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 and be more open to what he had to say. And now that he doesn't work for me, I treasure everything he tells me. So, uh, so that's, so that was a good thing. And, and so now I had the experience of hiring employees and having people work for me. And that's, um, that's taught me quite a lot. And I'm glad that I had that opportunity, you know, before it was just him and I working Mm -hmm. on it together. And when he left, I was like, uh Oh, (laughs) <laughs> well I mean yeah. I love I mean the sink or swim you totally obviously did not sink you're like you know doing a triathlon with wine at this point so yeah not a good analogy right. but anyway um sometimes I guess it takes those moments to really see what you can do and uh yeah that's awesome that you learned that you sound super self-aware and um sounds like you have a lot of the, the skills for having a really good marriage too which is not about wine but anyway um I like the taking responsibility. I think I have to take a page out of your book. (laughs) But anyway, um, so back to wine for a second. Um, so on your website, you have these awesome wine tasting placemats where you can like record the wines you're tasting and all that stuff. Um, if I were to host a wine tasting party, which now these little placemats have inspired me to want to do, what, what do you (laughs) think I should do aside from ordering your awesome placemats? Okay. Well, that's a great question because it sounds like a lot of fun. Um, the best type of tasting to do is a comparative tasting and, um, you can have snacks and things there, but I would actually leave them off to the side and focus more on the wine for, for the first tasting because wine and food, it it, it kind of mussies it all up and you really want to learn about tasting first, Mm -hmm. tasting wine first before, um, you do. And it's also easier and cheaper. Come on. We are just getting a few bottles And then uh, you get us all together, and then we taste. Um, But when you learn how to actively taste, you're looking at essentially uh, four different things. You're gonna you're gonna look at the wine. You're gonna look at the color of the wine. You you hold it over the white placemat or whatever, and you look at it. And you then you smell the wine, and you try to pick out flavors in the in the smells. And then um, you taste the wine. And when you taste wine, it's different than smelling. We talk a lot about the flavors. Oh, blueberries and vanilla and blah blah blah. Um, But when you taste wine, it's more about the structure. I and mean, people call this, what is structure? It's more about how it feels on your palate, like how it feels on your tongue and in your mouth. So in order to really taste wine, you got to switch it around, get it all over the place on, in your mouth, on your palate. And then when you small, swallow, you pay attention from the moment you taste the wine to the moment you swallow it. And even after that, what's happening in your mouth? What is your mouth tinkling? Is it is it really astringent and dry? You have a drying sensation in your mouth. Um, all of these things, these are the structure of wine. And that's actually the stuff that tells you if the wine will age well, hmm. which is really cool. Like if you taste a wine, it smells amazing and you taste it and it's kind of flat and simple on your palate and it doesn't have a lot of 
acidity or that astringent tannin or anything like that, it, it might not age that well, truly. It, it, it tastes great now, it should be drunk now, and you should enjoy it, and it's awesome. Um, but maybe it won't age more than, you know, four to five years max. Um, and, mo- and most wines don't, surprisingly. Most wines you buy in the grocery store are not meant to age all. They're meant to drink now. But uh, a few of them will. They'll go the, the while. And if if you like a wine and you like drinking it, the most fun to do, even if it doesn't age well, is to age it for a period of time, like a couple of years, and to taste how it changes and you'll learn a lot about wine if you do that. But yeah, getting back to this tasting thing, I would do a comparative <laughs> tasting. And how, how many how many different wines am I ordering here? And should they be white? I would and, do four. Four wines. White, four white wines. and red, or, or just white, or just red, or what? Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. What would I do? I think a lot of folks generally like. I would I would take an assessment of the group first before making that decision. Okay. If people tell you that you really like, they really like red wine and they'll drink nothing else, maybe we do a red wine tasting. Mm-hmm. Um, and vice versa. If people are open, uh, two by two would be really fun. Okay. Um, and you could do something like you get a decent, um, you really want to taste, if you do two by two, you want to taste the same grape. Um, you want to taste maybe Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand versus Sauvignon Blanc from France. Okay. Or or Sauvignon Blanc from Napa Valley versus Sauvignon Blanc from Chile or something like that. You want to taste uh, the same grape variety from a different region because then you realize the grape tastes different from different regions and you start to develop this repertoire of wines that you get to know. And I love to taste Sauvignon Blanc as one of the first wines everyone tastes because it really does communicate where it's from. And I also, for that same reason, I love to taste Syrah or Pinot Noir. Um, you know, Syrah from Australia versus a Syrah from France will blow your mind. Like, it's not even the same thing. It's not even on the same plane. But when you taste them alongside each other, you realize what's similar about them. But it's not what you think. And it's more about how the taste profile, like we were talking about, that mm-hmm. taste, taste part, yep. how it hits your palate. And so you realize the rock can be many, many things, but when you taste those two wines next to each other, and then you'll learn also about cool climate versus warm climate. And so the reason I picked Napa Valley versus coastal Chile or New Zealand versus France or things like that is, has a lot to do with the, the climate where it comes from. Hot climate wines have a totally different taste profile than cool climate wines. Um, they tend to be bolder. They tend to be more fruit forward. They tend to have sort of dried fruit characteristics to them, whereas cool climate wines tend to be more tart, more like it's more like it grew up in a cool climate. And it's like as if it was a tomato, it didn't get that sweet. Like it's it's from a cooler place. And um, if you do that, everyone in your group will suddenly pick which one they like more. They'll know. Deep down, they'll know which one they like more. And that's a clue. It, it tells you what regions you should go hunting for wine in. Like if you like hot climate wines, check out Spain or check out southern Italy or check out more of California or, um, you know, Australia. Like these are going to be your hot spots for wine. That's funny, hot spot. Um, <laughs> so um, that would be that would be the, the big tasting to do because not only are you testing climates, comparing climates with one another, but you're also learning more about these individual varieties. And I pick Sauvignon Blanc and Syrah, or Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir as really good examples, but there are other great grapes to do this with. Uh, Chardonnay would be one too. I love uh, Chardonnay. My, my favorite is Chardonnay from Napa Valley. That's my that's my go to. But maybe it's because I like warm weather myself. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, it could be. It, it could be you might be a warm climate wine lover, and that's great. Uh, you know, what, for the what longest you? time, for the longest time, that was my taste profile. And then my palate changed a little bit, and I like, I you know I drink everything under the sun, so I I don't know if I really have like a specific, but um, I tend to buy a lot of white wines when I'm just okay. I need to drink. I need that wine after a long day. Right. Uh, so that that's what I'm drinking these days. But who knows what I'll do next year? <laughs> we'll and see. When uh, when I have this fictitious little dinner party I'm thinking of doing um with the wine tasting 
Mm-hmm. Should I be giving everybody taste? Like, I know I'll give them the place mats, but you have a whole section in your book about tasting notes and the importance mm-hmm. of those. Should we be doing that as well? Yeah, you should take notes because everyone's going to write something different down. And and when you do it as a group, um, it can be hard for somebody who's slow to to take notes to develop their own thing. So it would be good if if you started it and everyone wrote down their notes first before you talked about it. So you start it and there's quiet time when people write their notes and taste and you do that for like, you could set a timer, you know, a little egg timer or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And you can write down your notes and then you can talk together as a group. And that is the best thing to do, I think, is to really take the time tasting yourself and then learn from other people in the group because everyone will have something unique to add because they all taste differently. And so you'll learn sort of doubly fast with comparative tasting with friends. It's, it's really a great method. It, it works like a champion. In fact, pretty much all master sommeliers have like really intensive tasting groups, which is, this is exactly what they do, but they do it with six wines instead of four. And they do three whites and three reds and they do them all blind. So they do them without knowing what they are and where they came from. And so their goal is to figure out what they are and where they came from in the blind tasting. So next time you're in either New York City or L.A., both of which I spent a lot of time in, and you want to come to my house and help me run one of these dinner parties? <laughs> that would be a lot of fun. Do you, ever you, know, do, do, you do that? Do you do that? Just I, 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 um, I, I know still you're... do tastings and stuff, but right now I'm doing something on my website, so I haven't, done, I haven't been running around lately. But um, I love L.A. I used to live there. It's so awesome. What part of L.A. you, you spent time in? In the Palisades? How about you? Oh, yeah. Wow. That's an awesome area. Um, I lived in Pasadena and, um, and in San Dimas when I lived there. I used to work in Pasadena. Yeah. Gosh. Anyway. Good old memories. <laughs> I, I love driving around that city. I love driving around the city at night. That was my favorite thing to do. Totally. Cause it just so goes beautiful. forever and ever and ever. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so aside from coming to my dinner party, what else do you have coming down the pike for you professionally? <laughs> <laughs> I like your shop. Um, professionally I am right now and actually it's releasing really soon in New York and in LA is the Psalm 3 film and I'm actually a pretty big role in that film um that was a documentary by Jason Wise it's part of the Psalm series if you've seen it Psalm 1 is a crazy crazy story about these guys that are trying to become master sommeliers and what they go through they actually take the test in the video and it's very very stressful and then some too they sort of explore what is wine and where it grows and sort of the magic of wine and then some three uh he's really trying to do something with wine jason wise is he wants to um pinot noir is now the you know for psalms and and people who collect wine is now sort of considered the most important grape and everybody looks to burgundy so he creates um actually a sommelier who was in the first um film puts together a tasting and to blind taste different Pinot Noirs from around the world in order to challenge Burgundy from its throne. Hmm. And um, some really big names in uh, the wine world are included in this film, and I sort of narrate the whole thing, so it's really cool. That's so awesome. Oh, my gosh. When does that come out? Um, well, it's, it, it premiered already, but it's it's – going to be out on itunes i think in november um and so it's coming out soon perfect oh i can't wait to watch it with uh, a big thing of wine in front of me <laughs> yeah you definitely need a glass of peanut water to, to watch this film done now i have my plans for november <laughs> anyway um well thank you so much for coming on moms don't have time to read books and uh moms really don't have enough time to drink wine either so this is a nice little uh um you know little tasting of, uh, of your intent, you know, immense knowledge and, and everything. So thank you so much for sharing it with me and, uh, and all the listeners. Thank you. All right. We'll take care, Madeline. Mm-hmm. Bye. Bye-bye. This episode of moms don't have time to read books has been sponsored by Nini's treats, Nini's treats.com. You won't leave a crumb. Mm-hmm.